we look for the soon return of Jesus, we want to know that we know him, that we're ready to see him face to face. And salvation is simple. It's all in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one that's good enough to be face to face with Jesus. It's all about what he did because Jesus, who knew no sin, who lived that perfect, sinless life, became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That means he bestowed, he put his righteousness on us. And so we can trust in him. And so we admit that it's not about us. We put our trust in Jesus, believe in him. And when we call out his name, we call on him and we receive him as our savior, we are sealed into the day of redemption. We talk about the day of the redemption all of t- all the time. That's I believe that's the rapture. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until he calls us home. And so that's, that's the good news of the gospel is that we belong to him. And we are looking forward to the rest of the gospel, which is that not only are we engaged, but there's a wedding coming. And so today we're going to look at the April prophecy update. We're going to look at some things that are going on. And we're also going to look at where we are in time in God's redemptive calendar. And it's so cool the way God always, everything with his feast and where we are in time, it always makes sense. And it always fits because that's how beautiful God is. And so we're going to look today at what's happening with Israel, and we're also going to look at what we have to look forward to and how it really does line up with Revelation. And so um, today we're going to look at Israel's final seven and some things that we're seeing right now leading up to that and the Lamb. So this is Revelation 5, 8 through 10. Now when he, Jesus, had taken the scroll The four living creatures, the 24 and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And one thing we're going to look at tonight is all throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to as the lamb. And if you trace him as the lamb through Revelation, you actually see what I believe is a chronological order of events. And so it's really, really cool um, what we're going to look at in just a little bit as we look at the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. So, but the living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth revelation 5 8 through 10 and so this is this is amazing because this right here tells you that when Jesus receives the scroll and we're going to talk more about that in a little bit the deed to earth when he receives it and he begins to take to remove the seals and and revelation the tribulation begins to unfold on earth we're there this is us who are those who have been redeemed to god by the blood of jesus from every tribe and every tongue and every people who are those that are made kings and priests to god because of the blood of jesus it's the bride we're right there in revelation 5 praising god and so i think that's so so cool so tonight Um, originally I was going to talk about the lamb, uh, because a lot of what we do is we follow the feast of the Lord. We follow where we are on God's redemptive calendar every year. And so right now we are nearing, um, this, I guess this weekend will be where we come to Nissan 10, which is lamb selection day. So we were going to talk about the lamb of God. And so this, this fits very well. We are still going to talk about the lamb of God, but we're also going to talk about the events that have been unfolding because we see, we see some tribulation events 
or and some events that are leading up to the tribulation. We're seeing some events unfold right now and start building right now that some of these things that are building are going to happen after we're gone. Some of these things could very well happen before we leave. So some of these things we may see, others are going to take place after we're gone, which it's it's bittersweet because we know things are going to get very difficult very quickly. But it's sweet because we know we're we're going to see our king. We're going to see our king soon. So we saw this war with Iran coming. We've been talking about Iran for a while. And, and really, we've been talking about how Iran, this really, they started this war on October 7th. They've been attacking Israel through their proxies. Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, all of these terrorist organizations that have been attacking Israel for the past six months have been funded and are receiving their orders from Iran. So this past Saturday, this huge prophetic development of Iran hitting Israel on her soil directly from Iran to Israel or attempting to hit Israel on her soil um, is, is really unprecedented. And it's taking the war, uh, Israel saying that is that was an obvious declaration of war from Iran to Israel. And that's taking it to a whole nother level to where things on Saturday, they went from, they, they are, they have escalated. We're still waiting to see how that plays out, but they have severely escalated from Saturday. Um, but one thing, one thing really interesting about Saturday too that I've been hearing, there was a scientist in Israel and um, he was talking about how this, this all started going down on the evening of Shabbat. It was, you know, the closing of Shabbat in Israel when all this was going down. And he said it was, it was an absolute miracle that he was looking at the number of weapons, and we're going to look at some of the numbers of weapons, um, the number of weapons that were fired at Israel, uh, many of them didn't even, didn't even go, that they, they blew up um, in Iran, they didn't make it out of Iran, they didn't make it to Israel, those that did, Israel was able to to um, intercept 99% of them. And there was very, very little damage done. And this gentleman was saying that mathematically, this, this, that was absolutely impossible, that this was divine, that God did this. And, and we, you know, we just witnessed a miracle. He, he actually compared it to a Red Sea moment. And so I think this is really cool because I don't know if you guys remember this is this is this is the screenshot from our um and this is just hitting me just now. This is cool. This this is a screenshot from the lesson that we did on Iran and our Red Sea moment. Um what was it, a few months ago where we talked about how Iran Persia, and especially the citadel of Susha, you know, we discussed the importance of Iran and Alam, which is where the citadel of Susha was, and how, and how so much had happened in this area biblically, and that it was tied to so many prophetic events biblically, that this is where Daniel's buried, it's where Daniel influenced King Cyrus, the Persian St. King Cyrus, who ended up sending the decree for Israel to be able to return to the promised land. Um, Queen Esther was in the citadel of Susha where she protected the Jewish people. She protected the children of Israel from a similar evil, Haman. Hamas and Haman are very similar names. And then, and of course it was Persia who was trying to complete commit genocide. And then Nehemiah who served the Persian king in the very same citadel years after Queen Esther, may have even known Queen Esther, because um, Mordecai is mentioned. Um, and, and, and I believe Nehemiah and Ezra, Mordecai is mentioned. And so 
there's all these connections with Persia, with Iran in the Bible when Israel was in dispersion and when they returned. And now here we see the same geographic location and it's really pivotal in Jesus' second coming and all of these all these pieces coming together, putting Israel in the place that she's going to be heading into the um, the seven year tribulation and Jacob's trouble. And so, how how neat here? Because because that rabbi I just I just read that um, or that that uh, scientist I just read that a couple hours ago, and and he was referring to Saturday as a Red Sea moment as as a as a splitting of the Red Sea moment. And uh, we're waiting on our Red Sea moment. We're waiting on that moment where we are, where we're raptured, where we're, where we're rescued before the sudden destruction comes. And so, you know, the significance of Persia and the significance of Iran, you know, today we see the same nation that has been biv- pivotal in biblical history and playing a role in the end of God's story this, you know, we're at the, like the climax of the story right now. We're, we're right at the edge of the big climactic scenes. And so God tells us that Persia, Iran will be part of the end time wars that are going to come against Israel. We see this in Jeremiah 49, and, and we're going to look in just a minute because there's a lot of stuff paving the way for Jeremiah 49 right now. Very, we could see this um, in days happen. Ezekiel 38 and 39. I believe that Ezekiel 39, when God supernaturally defeats Gog Magog, um, Gog and, and that whole uh, army, those armies of, of Russia, Persia, and, um, and uh, Jordan, and those that are coming with them, Turkey, those that are coming with them, when God defeats them miraculously, in the northern mountains of Israel. I do believe that is during the tribulation. But we're seeing some of the setup of that right now. And it even could begin to happen before we're raptured, perhaps. Uh, you know, we're seeing Psalm 83, the buildup um, as well. So today we see how how Iran may be behind the scenes in these in other coming wars as well, like Isaiah 17, because so much of those weapons they're sending into Damascus. And so she very well may be behind that. And of course, we see Psalm 83, Iran is behind all these proxy, all these proxy um, terrorists are being funded and they're getting their go-tos from Iran. So it's fascinating to witness this, you know, this biblical narrative is happening right before our eyes. And, you know, I love this meme. And I try to tell people as often as I possibly can, you're, you're literally in the Bible right now. I mean, we are literally living in the Bible. And I think biblical eschatology, the study of the end times is the absolute best discipleship tool and evangelistic tool. Because what we're seeing right now, if you're able to explain it, if you're able to show people that what's happening right now proves the Bible is true and real and is actually happening, what a wonderful way for people to see this is real. This is real. Get to know Jesus because he is true with with all the deception going out there. And so this here is what we're talking about with Alam the prophecy of Alam, and Alam is modern day where the citadel of Susha, it's the same area there where the citadel of Susha was, um, where again, Daniel, Esther, Nehemiah, King Cyrus, all of them in the citadel of Susha. So a really key place biblically for the return of Israel uh, after the Babylonian captivity. And so in Alam is the Bashir uh, nuclear power plant. And so Israel is preparing to strike Iran's nuclear sites. They're saying that this is an option that they may do. And so we know from Isaiah, for uh, not Isaiah, from Jeremiah 49, that Alam gets hit and Alam is destroyed 
and the inhabitants of Alam have to have to go. They have to disperse to the four corners of the earth. And so because of that, um, this may very well be the next move or one of one of a move that we that we see coming up. And so here, you know, this is the Lord of hosts. Behold, I will break the bow of Alam the foremost of their might. And so here, this power plant, and you think about it, the bow, what, what does that look like from, you know, from just a few days ago, Iran sent missiles, huge, huge, almost thousand pounds, some of these um, missiles into Israel. And to the ancient world, those would have looked like arrows, the bow. And so very interesting, the, the terminology that God uses in his word. And so here, you know, the I, uh, AEA chief is concerned that Israel will attack Iran's nuclear facilities. And um, that's biblically, we know something is going to happen there. Whether or not that's what Israel does is, is left to be seen. But we see here um, Iran's top general says that Iran will see a response, um, that Iran will see a response despite the calls for calm. So Netanyahu is ghosting um, the world, really. There are, um, especially the Western leaders are calling him, I believe um, Germany and maybe England, I forget, it's Germany and, and some other are on their way to Israel because he's not, he's not picking up the phone. He is saying he will not be deterred. He has to respond. But the world is telling him, just, just take the win. That's what America said. Just take the win and don't respond. Well, Israel has to respond. It would be seen as weakness. It would be seen as a failure if they did not respond to an unprecedented attack. There's never been an attack like what Iran did. It's a miracle of God that there weren't huge casualties from this attack. So um, here from Amir, uh, the Washington Post is reporting that Russia has committed to providing Iran with fighter jets and air defense technology to help them strengthen their, their defenses against an air attack by Israel or by the United States. And so here we know Russia is working with Iran. Um, I've got uh, a news article in just a second where, where Russia also is warning Israel that Iran does have nuclear warheads. Whether or not that's true, we, we don't know, but I wouldn't doubt it. And so here, you know, Israel was, was intercepting, intercepting missiles above the Dome of the Rock protecting and and I keep thinking this this may be how the dome this may be what happens to the dome of the rock they may end up you know the bad guys are on and their terrorist organizations they may be the ones that actually destroy the dome of the rock um, Netanyahu Iran is behind Hamas Hezbollah and others we're um, we are determined to win of course we we know that that Iran is the one behind all that and Iran threatens 1,500 missile strike if Israel launches revenge against, um, if, if, if they do have a revenge attack and that it will be an uncontrollable war. And we do see that, you know, you think about it, Isaiah 28, Israel is going to be pushed in a corner. And Israel, because of the fear of the overwhelming scourge, she is going to make a covenant with death. That's what God tells us in Isaiah 28. And so we can see the buildup of that right now through what's happening. We can see how everything is coming together exactly like God said it would. And so huge amounts of, of um, missiles and all of this happened in a short period of time. And praise God, there, there was no casualties. Only some lightly injured um, one child, I believe she's she's um, still in critical condition. Uh, but this is a miracle 
that there was that they weren't large casualties uh, from what Iran did. Israel's war cabinet considers whether to go big against Iran, and they're planning on doing that, that they want to launch a crushing attack despite the fears of catastrophic escala uh, escalation. You think about it, as far as Israel's concerned, they're looking at catastrophic, regardless of what they do, because their enemies are just barreling down on them. And if they don't show a big show of force, that's gonna be taken as weakness. And so here, this is what I was talking about. Putin is warning Netanyahu that Israel has nuclear warheads. Iran hails proxies for joining the attack. And I know Hezbollah was hitting, was hitting North Israel um, today. They were, they were hitting them back. Middle East, uh, here, this is the UN. Middle East is on the brink of devastating full-scale conflict warns UN Secretary General. And so of course they had to, you know, in their talk, see how many times they can cram the phrase peace and security, global peace and security. They have to see how many times they can, they can cram peace and security in, in speeches. So they're on that whole marathon of just how many times they can do that again. So what does this have to do with the lamb? Because we're talking about Lamb Selection Day and we're talking about the importance of having our focus on Jesus. And I keep thinking, you know, what did Jesus tell us to do when we see all these things? When we see all these things that we're seeing right now, how did he tell us to react? He told us to look up because our redemption draws near. And we are looking up. We know the rapture is going to happen soon. We know we're going to be face to face with our king soon. And, and that's look up. But I think also put your focus on Jesus rather than on all the crazy stuff going on, rather than getting caught up in fear, rather than getting caught up in, oh, if only there's a political leader that'll somehow save us. That's antichrist spirit. Okay, don't do that. If, if only this or if only that, instead of getting focused or instead of deciding, well, I'm just going to um, shut everything out and I'm just going to put my head in the sand and try to distract myself. Instead of doing all those survival mechanisms, focus on Jesus, focus on the lamb. Because think about Exodus. When Exodus happened, it looked like there was no hope. The children of Israel were, uh, their babies were being murdered. You know, they're, they, it looked like there was no hope. They, they were slaves. They, they were beat down and they thought this is the way it's always going to be. And what was the start? It was choose a lamb. And that was the start of bringing them out. And in Jesus's day here, it looked like all was lost. They had, you know, they had just crucified their king. But that was exactly what he came to do because he was the lamb that was chosen before the foundation of the world. And so we associate this image of Jesus as the lamb with Passover. And we should because he is the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. The only image that we should associate with his resurrection is the lamb. That's the only image we, uh, the lamb, Passover, Passover type things, right? Unleavened bread, that is what we should be focused on when we think about the resurrection, because that is what the Bible tells us to focus on. But did you know that Jesus is most referred to as the lamb in the book of Revelation? You know, there's a strong connection between Passover and Revelation. You know, we can, and I can be guilty of this, of putting, kind of putting things in buckets, like, okay, Passover bucket is Jesus's first coming, his life, death, and resurrection, the, the betrothal, him, his, his proposal to, his proposal to his bride, that is Passover. And then Revelation, we can put in the bucket of his return, which, you know, we have these images of his return having to do deal with the fall feast. But Jesus all throughout Revelation is referred to over and over again as the lamb. And so this imagery of Passover is constant throughout 
the book of Revelation, which, which really, when I actually stopped and thought about that, that was huge. So today, things seem, by human standards, they seem absolutely impossible for Israel, who, I mean, the whole enemies are surrounding her, and it's going to get worse. Everybody's going to be against Israel. We know that biblically. And for God's people in general, by human standards, everything looks lost. You know, of course, we know it's not falling apart. It's falling together. The beast system is an unstoppable force. They're not even trying to hide what they're doing anymore because they don't need to. That's because God is allowing the enemy to have his little space and time to give man what man desires, to give man what he's been asking for. Now, remember Israel in the day of, in, in Samuel's day, when they started, they started saying, we want a king like all the other nations. But God was their king. And, and he, he said, okay, fine. They're not, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And he gave them a king to their detriment. Well, it's like the same thing is happening today. The world, man wants a Messiah-like figure, but they don't want the Messiah. They don't want Jesus. They don't want God. They want a man to come and fix it. They want Mr. Fix-It-All. They want a guy to come, one man to come and fix it. And whether you're a Muslim, you're looking for your Mahdi, um, whether you're, uh, you're Jewish and you're looking for uh, the Messiah, but you're going to be fooled at first, whether you are part of the global world that's saying we need one central man with all the world. Remember what King Charles said with all, you know, the world's GDP at his disposal to fix it all. And they're going to receive the Antichrist. They're going to receive what they've been asking for. And but it'll just be for a short time, but they're going to receive that. God is giving man what man is asking for. And in the process of doing that, there will be many that wake up, that wake up out of it and realize that what they what they thought that they wanted is not what they really want. So it's hard to watch this, though. It's hard to watch the setup, knowing that many are going to prefer the lie. You know, God says that he sends this powerful delusion because people want to believe the lie. They reject the truth and they would rather live in darkness. And so they prefer the lie. But and it's hard to watch. But God told us that that would be the case. So even as we see that happen, we're seeing the Bible happen. And, and that's encouraging just to see God's word happen is encouraging. And it's hard to see America reject God. It's hard to see America reject God's people, and that's true Christians as well as the nation of Israel, to see America reject that. But God told us that he and he alone comes to Israel's rescue, and the entire world will turn against her, Zechariah 12, 3. So if America is still in one piece, which I kind of think that's not the case. I think America's about to be destroyed. But if America's still in one piece, America's a bad guy. Because all the world turns against Israel in the end. And so Biden approved the Iranian, the uh, Iranian, Iran's attack. So here Iran and Turkish officials are claiming that the White House was warned of the imminent attack on Israel and gave its approval, just went on to say not to take it too far. It doesn't, doesn't really make sense. I don't understand why, you know, it's, it's speaking out of both sides of the mouth to say, yes, you can do it, but then on the other hand, shoot, help, help to shoot down the rockets. Um, so exactly what game they're playing, I don't fully understand. But um, America is definitely playing both sides and is doing something underhanded. Um, Israel to the U.S., our deterrence has collapsed. We will attack Iran. So they're saying we can't. If they don't attack Iran, that is that surrender. 
the decision has been made. And so, uh, of course, Iran is saying there will be a tenfold counterattack. So it's going to get bumpy. So it's hard to watch America do that. It's hard to watch the counterfeit Christianity and the cults. And these are getting just oh my goodness, they're getting obnoxious, the things that are happening today. And the things that are happening underneath the umbrella of Christianity is, is horrible. Cults, the occult, they're winning the hearts of people. The masses are looking for religion and spirituality. They're looking for an experience, but they don't want God. They don't want the Bible. They want an experience. And that's exactly what scripture says, that that the um, Antichrist, that he will come with lying signs and wonders. And so we're seeing that the masses, they want an experience. They want to feel. And so the enemy's giving them feelings, but it's new age. It's, it's a cult. Uh, it's cults. Those are the ones that are really exploding in popularity right now. And, but God told us that this would happen. God said that along with the beast government, there would be a harlot religious system that rides the beast, Revelation 17. And, and we see that whenever, you know, the big global elites, they do their, you know, save the planet and the worship the planet things. They have representatives from all the major religions that are there to be part of this as well. So you have this coexist. There's even an office of coexistence. And so you have this coexist harlot that is riding the beast, riding this global government. And so I think this is a this is a good this is a good picture of it. The latest amazing truth, false truth, you know. The Bible, this is something that for 2,000 years, Christians didn't know. This is, this is this new thing that comes up. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, I don't want to know about it. Because everything that God wanted us to know, guess what, is in this book. And if you know this book, if you know God's word, and you read it from Genesis to Revelation, and don't just take it like... Um, a soundbite theology, if you don't just take it like your devotion and take a scripture here and a scripture there, if you read it, Genesis to Revelation and repeat, you don't want the latest amazing fake truth. You just want him and what he says, because he gave you everything you need. There's nothing new. All the new stuff that was delivered by an angel or by even Jesus, I say in quotation marks, that you know, Paul said, even if an angel comes and gives you a different gospel, there's something more that you've been missing out on. It's the same lie that Satan told Eve in the garden. God's keeping something from you. You're, you're missing out on something. There's something more. Don't believe it. Everything you need, he, he put in that Bible. And so choose the lamb. It's the same, same today as it always has been. Choose the lamb. As hard as these days can be watching these things, remember, Jesus said, look up. We must keep our eyes on him and remember that God is completely sovereign. Nothing that's happening right now is outside of his control. Everything is lining up. That's how awesome he is. He works everything to his end. And the answer is the same. Choose the lamb. Lamb selection day. As just as Jesus was coming in on Nisan 10, the lambs were coming in and every family was to choose a lamb for their self. And we choose Jesus. We choose him as our lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So Jacob's trouble, Israel's final seven, will bring many to salvation and they will choose a lamb for themselves. God will put an end to man's corrupt rule and he's gonna set up his millennial kingdom as a conclusion to these final seven years. And so he's going to, he's got all that coming. And so this right here is the document um, that the Temple Institute have put in for the Passover 
lamb. Now, this, this is something that they do every single year. So it is important to know that they do this every year. This isn't, um, not that this isn't significant because they keep trying. They keep trying and they're turned down, um, but they do it every single year. They put in the, the request to sacrifice the lamb on the Temple Mount. And every year it's turned down for, for obvious reasons, for, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Muslims would totally freak out. But there is a lie that's been going around. This right here has been going around with the lie that this is about the red heifers, but nowhere does it say red heifer and they would not sacrifice the red heifer on the Temple Mount. That would be, that they would, they would be going against what God said in the Bible because God said that it has to be outside the camp. And so they wouldn't sacrifice it on the Temple Mount. And, um, and actually I watched one of the, the temple, I, think, I believe it was one of the temple rabbis was furious about this because he said it was actually a blood libel where, um, where people were trying to get Christians mad at, at, um, at the Temple Institute um, and, and using this. And so, and he said, this is, you know, he, he read it because he was saying, this is, you know, the problem is people don't know Hebrew. So they're, you know, but he said, this is the same thing that they do every single year um, that the heifers, that they wouldn't sacrifice the heifers on Passover uh, because the only thing that you're supposed to sacrifice on Passover is the lamb. And so I think that is an interesting thing just to kind of know there's so much misunderstanding. Um, now they're going to sacrifice those heifers. They are. Um, exactly when, we, we don't know yet, but that could, that doesn't have to happen before we're raptured either. So um, it all starts with the lamb. So Christ is our Passover lamb. Our salvation starts with him. Everything starts with the lamb. So we must understand Passover to really understand the resurrection because the resurrection is in the box of Passover. That's, that's where it happened. The resurrection was the feast of first fruits in the Passover feast, Passover unleavened bread and feast of first fruits. The resurrection is a part of the Passover feast and the book of revelation of Jesus uh, we need to understand Passover because that is the title, the lamb that Jesus has all throughout. So not understanding that connection uh, gets in the way. And so that it makes a lot of sense that the enemy has spent so much energy trying to distance our understanding of what Jesus did on the cross and instead have us think about bunnies and eggs and, and images um, of fertility and things like that, that has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus and what he did and what he's gonna do. And so what is the purpose of the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus. It is the revealing of our King. That is what it means. That's the whole book of Revelation. What it's about is him revealing himself to his bride and to the entire world. And so he's revealing himself as the lamb and he's revealing himself as the conquering king. But it's because of the lamb that redemption has been paid for. It all comes out of what he did on the cross as that sacrificial lamb. So this thought may be surprising at first because the images that come to mind um, are not usually of a lamb. But in Revelation, Jesus is most referenced as the lamb. He is referenced as the lamb, as the lamb 29 times. It's incredible. And so we have this prophetic, we have this prophetic picture here. Um, Passover was fulfilled by Jesus' first coming. His life, his death, and his resurrection fulfilled. Pentecost here was fulfilled um, by the Holy Spirit. And, and even saying that it's, it's fulfilled, but it still is going to be playing out again because part of God writing 
his word on, on men's hearts was specifically promised to Israel. So we have, we've been a partaker of that, but Israel is, is going to partake of that. There's going to be a, there's going to be another Pentecost during the tribulation and the fall feast. They have yet to be fulfilled. One day they're going to be fulfilled in Jesus, the second coming in the millennial kingdom and the new heaven and new earth. These fall feasts are going to be fulfilled. And so God carved out these seven months to walk man through his redemptive calendar. And we right here um, are on Nissan 10 looking at land selection day. And so God isn't done with Passover. You know, Passover is, is still so much of it, uh, so much of the imagery we, we still have left to see. It's also helped me to see that God um, isn't done with Passover in relation to Israel or the bride. And this is becoming clearer as we see these events unfold, as we see that every year the Temple Institute petition for the Passover lamb and one year it's going to be approved and they're going to sacrifice the Passover lamb on the temple. We'll be gone then. I firmly believe we'll be gone then, but one year they're going to be able to do that. So Israel will see Jesus as their lamb when he returns and many before he returns, before the end of the seven, they will see that he is their Messiah and they will see him as their Passover lamb. The fourth cup of the Seder. You now we're going to have a Seder this Saturday. I'm so excited about it. And the fourth cup here is yet to be fulfilled for Israel and for the bride. Here, the, the fourth cup here is the... Um, I will bring you into the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. That 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 will I will take you to me as a people. I will take you to to be my people. Sorry, number seven here. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. And so this right here, Jesus is still going to take us to be His people. We're His people now, but He's going to take His bride. And all of Israel, when he returns, all of Israel will receive him as their savior and he will be their God and they will be his people and they will live in the land that he swore them and they will never again be moved out. And so all of this is going to happen. And, you know, the fourth cup there, that is the cup Jesus said, I'm not going to drink again until I am with you in my father's house. Here, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. And so this is what he said over the third cup, the cup of salvation. But the fourth cup, this cup, this is the one he said he's gonna drink with us anew in his father's house. This is that cup of completion. This is our wedding cup. And so it's all started with the Passover lamb. Passover was Jesus's entry into Jerusalem as king. And Jesus entered on lamb selection day, Nisan 10. The revelation of his completion of what, revelation is the completion of what he started on that day. Because he started on Revelation on um, when he came into Jerusalem as king, that that's the start. And then he is fulfilling all of that in Revelation as that lamb. So the lamb that causes death to pass over. In Exodus, we see that all who applied the blood of the lamb were protected from the angel of death. You know, notice it wasn't enough to kill the lamb. The blood of the lamb had to be applied. The final and most severe plague, the death of the firstborn, was the plague that revealed the answer. Not just how Israel would escape death and bondage to Egypt, but how mankind would escape the penalty to sin. The blood of the Passover lamb applied caused death to pass over. The blood of Jesus, our lamb of God, applies, applied causes death to pass over us. So 
we see here, Jesus is that lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. The path, Passover is the new beginning. It's the new year, the new redemption calendar, the new religious redemption calendar. It's the beginning of God calling Israel to himself. And it's the beginning of God fulfilling his plan of redemption. All started with the lamb. And it's been nearly 2000 years now since Jesus finished. Um, but God's time isn't our time. With God, a thousand years is of a day. And, you know, we see this in Second Peter. And we see this beautiful picture of, of how God has given man seven. He's given man 7,000 years. And so Second Peter 3, 8 says, Beloved, that um, do you don't want you to overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. So this isn't just words to illustrate how long suffering God is. This is literal. The lamb was chosen four days before it would be killed for the people. Jesus came into Jerusalem on Nisan 10, just as those lambs did. And he was chosen for four days before he was handed over, just like the lambs to the priest, to be inspected again before being killed, before being sacrificed. And he is also the lamb chosen before the foundation of the world, four days or 4,000 years before he was born, before, before he died. And so we see here this picture of how you can overlay it over a week. And here Jesus was born day four, 4,000 years. There's two days. And then we are right here before the tribulation period. There's the millennial reign of Christ, and then there's a new heaven and a new earth. So we see here, Jesus is that lamb without blemish, without spot, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20. So it's been nearly two days or 2,000 years since Jesus covered us with his blood and finished his work of redemption. So what does the Bible tell us about two days? Because the Bible tells us what will happen after two days. Hosea 6, 1 through 2. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us to pieces. This is specifically about Israel, but he will heal us. He has wounded us but he will bind us, bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. And so this perfect timing of God that Israel would return at the end of the two days, that all these things would be converging right at the end of 2000 years is God's perfect timing. So Jesus came to die the first time. He came to be the lamb, but still there are consequences of rejecting the Messiah. When Israel rejected the promised land out of fear, they roamed in the wilderness for 40 years. But when Israel rejected the promised Messiah, they had to wait 40 Jubilees or 2000 years to be revived as Hosea foretells. So the Gospels, we see Jesus fulfill Passover, and he came as that spotless lamb, and we see the start of our redemption in Revelation, and, and so Jesus finished it, and so we look at the book of Revelation here, and I'm going to try to go through this quickly, because I know I've talked, I've rambled too much, <laughs> so um, the book of Revelation references Jesus as the lamb 29 times. The first three books of Revelation, Jesus is addressing the seven churches, and John, John describes him in similar way to how Jesus looks when he comes back at the end of the tribulation as king of kings. As the son, he is one like the son of man, and he is fierce, fire in his eyes. He has that kind of countenance. But then when we start in chapter five, we see Jesus being described as the lamb, um, and, and we see this pattern of him being described as the lamb. So in chapter four, John is caught up. Um, I believe that's the rapture. He is caught up or raptured to heaven to witness 
the events of the tribulation unfold from heaven's perspective and uh, whether or not we'll see that perspective as well I'm, I'm not sure I kind of I kind of think we may see some of what John got to see and uh, so here we see and I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither look upon it. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look upon it. Now the book here, the scroll, is the deed to earth. This is this is the deed to earth. And in ancient Israel, this is uh, the ancient world. This is, that's what it would look like written on both sides and it would be sealed up and it could only be opened um, with the witnesses there and by the original owner. So through Adam's fall, the earth had been surrendered to Satan, but Jesus redeemed all creation at the cross. And so here, um, continuing in Revelation, and one of the elders said to me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, in the midst of the elder stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth to all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. So here we see God, the father and God, the son. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Having every one of them harps and golden vials full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. And this is this is what we saw at the beginning. Here, they saying this, this, this is where we know that this is us. This, this right here is representing of us. For you were slain, speaking of Jesus, you were slain and have redeemed us to God by the blood of every, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And we know we reign on the earth with Jesus for the thousand years. And so here, this is us. We're there as he begins. We're here at the beginning of the tribulation as he is beginning to open it up. This is pre-tribulation stuff right here. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands, a number that cannot be counted saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such were in the sea and all in them heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, amen. And the four and 20 elders fell down and worshiped him that live forever and ever. And you see all this, the lamb is so significant. This picture of Passover. Jesus came to die as the lamb to redeem mankind. All of creation. This is God's plan for redemption of mankind. It's already finished from the start. And now we watch it unfold. Jesus is worthy to take the scroll, so he's taking the deed to earth, and then Jesus opens the scroll. So we see here in, in chapter six, Jesus is the judge. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts said, come and see. And as Jesus reclaims the earth, wrath begins to pour out on earth. Uh, Satan's kingdoms are being torn down. And Jesus is a righteous judge. With each seal that's removed, God's wrath is intensifying. And, you know, the global elites and how the world, they want just one world government. They want the anti-Messiah. They, they, they're going to get what they want and everything's going to fall apart. The lamb in the midst of the throne, chapter seven, Jesus is our savior. So John sees a multitude from every tribe and tongue before the throne of God. And 
And um, so we're revealed here in chapter seven that these are the tribulation saints. Here, Revelation seven, these are they that came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white with the blood of the lamb. For the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto fountains of water and God shall wipe away all the tear from their eyes. And so during the tribulation, a multitude that cannot be numbered will come to Jesus as savior. God is compassionate and many people are gonna turn to him and escape an eternity separated in hell. Now we don't want anyone to have to go through the tribulation, but the tribulation is also gonna be mercy because it is gonna be the greatest wake up call ever. People are gonna realize how true this is. People are going to receive Jesus and that's mercy because eternity is forever. Chapter 13, the Lamb's book. And here we see that Jesus is worth it. Many are gonna turn to the truth, Jesus, during the tribulation, but unfortunately God also tells us that many will turn to the lie instead. In chapter 13, the Antichrist and the false prophet are worshiped by the world as a whole. And those who refuse to worship the Antichrist will be martyred. So we see Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth, this, so this means like the masses of people, shall worship him, the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So those that do not receive Jesus, they're going to worship the Antichrist. The enemy continues to let no crisis go unused. True to form, the Antichrist uses the increasing chaos to implement his mark of the beast and to raise an army against the lamb. You know, the Bible describes the, the final war that they see Jesus and they know who he is and they want to make war against him. So that just shows you the depravity. And we can already start to see it, just the depravity of the world. Um, it's shocking every day the things that people will do. Chapter 14, the lamb on Mount Zion. Jesus is Israel's protection. So although the tribulation saints are given over to the Antichrist, Israel is not given over to the Antichrist. 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes are sealed and protected to spread the gospel during the tribulation. They're led and they're protected by Jesus. God is completing his final week of Daniel, 70 weeks to Israel. And we're seeing the first fruits of Israel return to God as his people and he as their king. And so here we see Revelation 14. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him a hundred and forty four thousand having his father's name written on their foreheads. These are they which are not defiled with women for they are virgins and they are which follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. And they will redeem, they were redeemed from men, being the first fruits unto God of the Lamb. So here we see the 144,000 are young, young um, Hebrew men, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We see that in Revelation 7. So the purpose of this final seven years is restoring Israel. Uh, our focus is, is often on God's wrath against Satan and those who worship him. But the lamb is focused on the redemption of Israel. And, and he's working on that through it. That Israel is realizing that Jesus is their lamb, that Jesus is their Messiah. So chapter 15, the lamb's song. He is victory. Jesus is our victory. Revelation 15, two through three. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image and over the mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. And so here we see those who died for Jesus during the tribulation, and they're here and they're singing a song. 
um, here on the on the, the sea of glass. So here we see the tribulation saints again, and this is the hope for those that um, do not receive Jesus before the rapture, there is a great outpouring during the during the, the seven years of tribulation. That brings us to chapter 17, the lamb in battle. He overcomes. So Revelation 17, 12 through 14, and the 10 horns, this is the beast, the beast system that has 10 kings, which are saw are 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make their war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the world government and those greedy for power to appear um, are, are gonna appear to be winning for a little while. You know, it's an unstoppable force for now. The Antichrist will seem to be the answer, and this will be short-lived. The tribulation is only seven years, and the world powers are going to be united for less than that to rule. So Satan has spent these 6,000 years manipulating the kingdoms of man. Uh, he had power over all the kingdoms of the world, but now his power will fall to the kingdom of the Lamb. And it'll never rise again. He will, Jesus is, will never um, surrender his kingdom ever again. So chapter 19 here, the lamb of the marriage supper. Jesus is our bridegroom. Uh, I love this. Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that, granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do it. For I am a fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is all about Jesus. As all the chaos is playing out on earth with the seals opening and Satan's world government collapsing, there is a wedding taking place in heaven. The king is claiming his kingdom and his bride, and that's us. So chapter 21, the Lamb of New Jerusalem. Jesus is our home. He is home. You know, when we say, I just want to go home. I can't wait till we get to go home. Understand it's him. That is who we want. That is our home. Our home is him. Come hither and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it had a wall great and high, had 12 gates and gates, 12 angels and names were written on them. And each of the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty had and the lamb are the temple of it. There's not a need for a temple because God is right there in the midst of us. We don't need to go through anything. And the city had no need for the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did light it, did light it. And the lamb is the light thereof. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever that works abomination or lies, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so that is our home. He is our home. And this beautiful place that he's been building for us for 2,000 years. It took God six days to make everything we know, the entire universe. And he's been working our home for 6,000 years incredible. So at the end of every Passover Seder, there's the proclamation next year in Jerusalem. Uh, yes, this is the heart cry of Jews and to us too, but more for us, it's new Jerusalem that we desire. We desire our home. 
This brings us to chapter 22, the lamb of the throne. Jesus reigns. Revelation 22, one through three. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the lamb. In the midst of the street of it on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations and they shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and the servants shall serve him. And we see that same beautiful river explained in even more detail in um, Ezekiel 47. And so it's just so incredible, so incredible what we have to look forward to. So the final thought here is that in Revelation, we see creation restored. Jesus is king and everything is redeemed to him because of his sacrifice as the Passover lamb. It all started with the lamb and it finishes there too with the lamb of God. And so I hope this was encouraging to you guys as we see things are going to get really bumpy very soon. Um, stay encouraged because we are so close to seeing the Lamb of God face to face. We're so close to seeing that whole scene in the throne room and seeing him begin to take off those seals from the scroll and just, ah, what we're about to see face to face is, is going to be incredible. So I hope you're blessed.